thank you for the body and the blood of Christ. We are grateful that um, Christ was willing to take on um, and accomplish what we could never do in our own power um, to create a new relationship with you. And for that, we praise you and pray that um, in all that we do and think that um, we would continue to grow into the likeness of Christ to become the children of God that you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Andrew. So as we've been doing over these last few weeks, as we've been walking our way through Exodus, uh, we've tried to involve the children in starting out our time with a question that's for them. And the question I have for you this morning is actually quite personal for me, just because it's something that when I was your age, I actually struggled with quite a bit. But here's a question I have for you, Simon. Are you ready? And for everybody else, actually. <laughs> just Simon, actually. No, no, for everybody. Have you ever gotten mad? Do you ever get angry? Yeah, I see some heads going up and down, sure. Um, yeah, we get mad. So, Simon, since I already called your name, what are, what are some things that make you mad? When my brother's being annoying, I have 11 brothers. I know exactly what you're talking about. That is annoying. 11 times, uh, yeah. So, what about you guys over here? Anything ever make you mad? Anything make you mad? <laughs> you can't point to them. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Hunter. Something on a TV show. Yeah, that could make me mad too. Yeah. What about anybody else? Anybody here get mad? What makes you mad? Nothing, huh? You guys are all a bunch of calm, peaceful. Yes, okay. Yes. <laughs> not now, not now. Let's save it for the car ride home. <laughs> yeah. Right? Sisters, brothers, uh, family, of course. You know, it seems it's one of those weird things that those people we're supposed to love the most often are the ones that always, you, not always, but often are the ones that kind of tick us off the most. Um, so we also get upset sometimes when somebody, or it could be a brother or a sister, a mom or a dad, or a friend or anybody, a teacher, anybody who does anything that would, in your mind, mistreat something that you think is valuable, something that you think is really special, right, Anna? So if you have something that's really special and, and your brother just, like, comes along and kicks it, you, you wouldn't get mad because you're just too sweet of a person, right? Yeah, look at her smile. Right. So when people mistreat things that are really important to us, uh, for example, there's a time when I was, I think I was around 13 or 14. I can't remember the exact age, but I know I was around that age. Um, I saw classmates of mine who I really wanted to fit in with. I wanted to fit in because they were like the cool crowd, and I wanted to be a part of the cool crowd. And then one day, they decided amongst themselves that they were going to pick on this one kid. They gathered together, the two or three of them that I wanted to be a part of that group, and they gathered together after a basketball game at school, and they took this kid out back, and they were just bullying him and picking on him, and, and they actually beat him up for no reason at all. None. And I'm watching this, and um, I stood by, and I didn't do anything at all. And, I, and now I really regret that. And as a matter of fact, even on that, next, that night, when I went to bed, I couldn't get that image out of my mind. And it really made me mad. I, made, I was mad at myself, actually. You ever been mad at yourself, honestly? You ever been mad at yourself, Hunter? Never? <laughs> wow. That's awesome. Well, I've been mad at myself, and there was one of those chances. As a matter of fact, it still bothers me today. It really does. It actually was a shaping moment in my life um, that I didn't stand up for what I knew to be right. And so fast forward a couple more years. Now I'm 16, 17, um, and there's another bully trying to pick on another kid who didn't really fit in. And this time, I wasn't about to let that just happen. So I went up to the bully and I said, hey, leave him alone. Mind your own business. And you know what he did? No, he punched me. That's, no, not right on the spot. No. Um, but he did challenge me to a fight after school. You see, that was always the way. Oh, you want to fight? Uh, 
sure, whatever. Uh, after school, meet me here, that kind of place, you know. So the problem is he was considerably bigger than I was. Uh, not huge, but considerably bigger. I was, just for the record, when I was 16 years old, I want you to know I was 4'10 and weighed 115 pounds. I was just a little guy. And so he was not 4'10 and he did not weigh 115 pounds. Um, so yeah, uh, but I was the one to open my big mouth. And so what was I going to do? Say no. So um, I'm not proud of the course that I took, just, just for the record. I'm not recommending fighting, but I did go fight this kid, the bully. And what actually happened, though, was really kind of laughable. It wasn't much of a fight at all. It was really funny, actually. I don't even think anyone actually, actually threw a punch. The only thing I remember is um, he did the whole karate kid thing. No joke. <laughs> I'm not joking. He really did pull this out. And I'm like, that, are you trying to make me laugh so you can like, get water and make me tear up and everything? But like I said... Um, I'm not recommending fighting, but sometimes you have to fight for what you believe in. And so I want our fight, as pastor now, I'm switching gears, and I'm thinking, I want our fight to be the right fight for the right cause, right? So, and this presidential election cycle has a lot of people fighting for standing up really for who or, or what is so important to them. Now, when I was a younger guy, uh, so here I am thinking again of, of the kids here this morning. I never got it. I never got why people got all worked up. It's like, what's the big stinking deal? It's just a presidential election. How, how boring. You know, that's what I thought when I was a kid. And so I, I reckon that you might be in that place. Um, you know, I think the last time I might have ever shared anything from this platform that could even remotely be construed as political would have been probably four years ago when uh, we were facing our last presidential election. And today I'm going to ask you for just, uh, if you'd indulge me, if I could do that again for this election. So I want to say two things right up front though. First, um, I am in no way endorsing a candidate to you. Not even going to come close. Or all actually I'm trying to do is, is actually persuade you to, the, to nothing other than glorifying God with your conscience when you vote. But the other thing I want to just acknowledge right up front is that I, I understand and, and get that, that I have the microphone this morning and you don't. But I also understand and am greatly humbled by that weight that comes with that. And I promise you this morning, while in fact every morning I stand up here at this platform, I understand the immense responsibility and accountability before Jesus and you that comes with having the microphone. I'm not exaggerating a bit, honestly. Um, when I tell you I feel the weight of this responsibility almost every waking moment of my life. Uh, the weight I feel before Jesus and, and you to correctly handle the Word of God and to present it to you in a way that causes us to turn our gaze to Jesus, um, that would cause us to be convicted by the Holy Spirit, that would cause us to be transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ. That weight of presenting the gospel to us is not only the most beautiful truth ever, but also our greatest need. The greatest need of our hearts is the gospel. The weight of this honestly never escapes me. In my lifetime, though, I don't think that I've um, seen a more contentious election cycle. Maybe the, the next closest one in my lifetime would have occurred four years ago. Of course, this is really a matter of perspective, right? I'm, I'm a, I like to think of myself as a young guy. Uh, <laughs> that's not so true anymore, but of course, this is a totally a matter of perspective, though. That's why I said in my life. I know that there have been crucial points over history of these United States that have completely changed the course and direction of our great nation. Um, but I've wondered for weeks, what's my responsibility before God? What's my responsibility before you as a pastor? How might it address this important topic in the life of our great nation? 
right? Will what I even say even matter? Uh, will it have any impact at all? I've been asking myself these questions. What, if anything, should I share from the platform? What is my responsibility? What's, what's our responsibility as the church of Jesus Christ in America regarding politics? Here's where I landed, all right? Here's where I landed as pastor. In a moment, we're going to take a look at Psalm 146. And that's going to be um, page 625 in the Pew Bible. You might want to get yourself ready there. We're going to use that this morning as our landing and launching space. But before I do that, before I jump to Psalm 146, I want to make five promises to you this morning that I think are important for us together. Uh, then after we look at Psalm 146, I'm going to bring five reminders. Uh, they're not long drawn out. They'll move along pretty quickly. But they're five promises and, and five reminders that for us as believers in Christ, that we walk in these. Both the promises and the reminders are really rooted out of this Psalm 146. But here are the five promises I want to make to you. You ready for the first one? Because the first one I think is really profound. Here's the promise. I promise that the president you wake up to on November 4th is going to be flawed and sinful. Period. But we're also still called to submit to him as the leader. As long as he's not calling us to do anything ungodly, you're still going to be called to pray for him you're still called to respect the office which he holds as the one who's been placed there by a sovereign God. Secondly, I promise that God is still on the throne, no matter what. Sovereignly ruling over the affairs of humanity. I promise you that I will push us to realize and remember that our citizenship as believers in Christ is not of this earth. I'm going to promise to remind us that we are first and foremost citizens of heaven. This is not our home. We are sojourners. We are exiles passing through on our way to our eternal home with Jesus Christ in heaven. And I promise then, as a result of that mindset, to continue to preach and teach that before any responsibility we might have to our great nation, we are first and foremost responsible for the souls of this community. That God will hold us accountable for the gospel to this community, to this nation, to this world. And so lastly, I'm going to promise right now to continue to work with all the Spirit's might within me to prepare every soul for eternity. And eternity that can rejoice in the present, regardless if we're stripped of every right, every freedom that our great nation currently provides. You know, there's a couple of articles that were uh, going about this last couple of weeks. One was written by John Piper, and it was a, uh, just an article, um, what he's thinking through, and then there was a response from uh, a theologian, Wayne Grudem. If you haven't heard or read these articles, I'd encourage them to you. But I wanted to read just a small portion of what uh, John Piper reads. And he says, uh, and it's titled, A Word to Pastors. But it's not just for pastors. It's for all of us. And this is what he writes. May I suggest, pastors, that in the quietness of your study, you do this. Imagine that America collapses. First, anarchy then tyranny, from the right or the left. Imagine that religious freedoms are gone. What remains for Christians is fines, prison, exiles, and martyrdom. Then ask yourself this. Has my preaching, or has our learning, has our faith, been developing real, radical Christians, Christians who can sing on the way to the scaffold? Are we developing Christians who will act like believers in the believers in Hebrews 10.34 where he says, you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession, an abiding one. Christians who will face hate and reviling and exclusion 
for Christ's sake, and yet, according to Luke chapter 6, rejoice in that day, leap for joy, and behold, their reward in great is, is great in heaven. And so he goes on to say, have you been cultivating real Christians who see the beauty and the worth of the Son of God? Have you faithfully unfolded and heralded the unsearchable riches of Christ? Are you raising up a generation of those who will say with Paul, I count everything as loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord? Have you shown them that they are exiles and sojourners and that they are citizens in heaven from which they await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ? Do they feel in their bones that to live is Christ and to die is gain? And Piper concludes with this. Or have we neglected these greatest of all realities and repeatedly diverted their attention into the strategies of politics? Have you inadvertently created the mindset that the greatest issue in life is saving America and its earthly benefits? Have you shown your people that the greatest issue is exalting Christ with or without America? Have you shown them that the people who do the most good for the greatest number, for the longest time, are people who have the aroma of another world with another king. Yes, to be clear, there's a lot at stake. However, as pastor, and as a church body, not just as pastor, our first calling is not to the preservation of this great nation or its constitution. Now, having said that, as I was thinking about that, if I heard that, I think it's important that it brings some clarity as to what I don't want you to hear in that statement, that our greatest and first calling is not to the preservation of this great nation or constitution. What I don't want you to hear, I don't want you to hear that the constitution isn't critically important. I believe it is. I don't want you to hear that these United States aren't a blessing and worth fighting and even dying for. I believe they are. I don't want you to hear that Christians should not be deeply and even fiercely involved in politics and the political conversation. I absolutely believe it's imperative that believers should be. But what I am hoping is that by the Spirit of God, you'll hear is that our first calling isn't to our great nation or political ideology or even president. And here's why I think this is that crucial. Because we portray an idol when we portray by our actions that that is true. We portray a false hope and false God when we act in such a way that portrays we believe that our hope our safety, our security, our justice, our protections, our welfare, the welfare of this nation are somehow directly in the hands of a president or governing body. We portray a false God and a false hope when we wrongly connect the freedoms that God has afforded us through this great nation as somehow inherently and directly necessary for our Christian faith. That's a false hope. Our first calling and our greatest passion is to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and His gospel. And this is where you say, Amen. Right? I hope. Look, let's take a look at our passage this morning as the place to bring these truths to bear on our hearts. Psalm 146. It's, a, it's only a 10 short verses and it starts with praise the lord that's what he starts with praise the lord oh my soul i will praise the lord as long as i live i will sing praises to my god while i'm alive put not your trust in princes in sons of men in whom there is no salvation when their breath departs they return to the earth, and on that very day their plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoner free. 
The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourner. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. But the way of the wicked, he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever, he says, verse 10. The Lord will reign forever, your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. So yeah, here in verse 1 and 2, really is a call from the psalmist to recalibrate our hearts. To recalibrate our hearts. To exalt God above all things and people. That's the call. That God is worthy of praise, our deepest, deepest soul's praise. Setting our minds concretely this way sets our minds and our hearts in the right uh, posture, the right place. It enables us to put everything else particularly our love for our great nation and our politics, in proper perspective. See, going into the voting booth, and it were, and as it were, in praise, having settled first that God is Lord in your heart, is crucial. You see, praise, the Psalms reminds us, that praise should be the distinguishing mark of the Christian, even in a contentious election cycle. Every anxious moment, every distress, every fear. It's recalibrating our hearts. It's recalibrating our emotions. It's recalibrating our thoughts. It reminds us who God is. Who is the sovereign one? Who is the true king? Where does our real hope lie? And where is our true citizenship? I hope that what I'm about to say to you isn't a surprise. I've already said it once, but, but our candidate of choice is flawed and sinful. To quote Alistair Begg, the best of men are men at best. That's it. The best man is just a man at best. The one who puts their trust in princes or presidents will be disappointed. But the one who puts his trust in the Lord our God will never be disappointed in the Lord because God is faithful, true, and right. He's the only one who's infinitely more powerful than man. And this psalm reminds us that salvation belongs to our God, right? Salvation belongs to our God. So in verse 3 and 4, the psalmist exhorts us once again, don't trust in presidents. Don't look to presidents to do what presidents aren't ordained to do. Presidents don't provide salvation, hope, social justice, social welfare. And you're thinking, wow, really? Salvation is only by faith in Jesus Christ. The hope of all humanity rests in Jesus Christ. The cause of social justice and social welfare was never intended to be handled by the governing state, but by the people of God as they put their faith in God. So Psalm 146 is that stern reminder for us regarding our hope and our trust, right? So the word trust he uses in this passage is actually a, a verb in a sense that expresses that sense of putting our personal and our national safety and security in the hands of a human leader. And he's, don't do that. Don't do that. You can't look to your candidate for what you should only be looking to God for. I, I know we know this intellectually, and I'm not saying anything new to anybody here, right? But in practice, um, as attested to by the fierce positions or even the fierce oppositions, it's some por sometimes portrayed as though the world is going to completely crumble and our lives are going to be ruined if the wrong guy gets in the White House. That portrays a false hope and a misguided trust. As we move through Psalm 146, we come to verses 5 and 6. And here, the psalmist offers us a contrast. Here's the contrast. The one who looks to the Lord is actually marked by happiness. He said blessed. And that word blessed means happiness. I know we try and make other things out of it like it's joy. No. Happiness belongs to the one who trusts in the Lord. 
They're marked by praise and happiness. Verse 6, because the Lord is the creator, because the Lord is the faithful sustainer, he's the one we look to who's going to execute justice. He's the one who's going to give food, sets free, loves the souls of mankind. He watches. Listen to this. He watches. He's attentive to the oppressed, the hungry, the enslaved, the blind, the lowly, the immigrant, the widows, the fatherless, because he's good. Psalm 118, verse 8, reminds us in a different way. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. He says, it's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in presidents. He uses the word princes, but it's the same. Or Psalm 60, <clears throat> oh, grant us help against our foe, for vain is the salvation of man. But with God we shall do valiantly. So, uh, just a quick run through of that psalm really brings us to a place of five necessary uh, recalibrating reminders. And that's all these are. They're, they're in no means new to you. Um, you'll know each one of them, but they're really just five reminders to help us recalibrate our hearts as we go through this. As believers in Christ, these are reminders that we live and walk in and establish our hope on. And our first reminder is as plain as what he says in that passage. God's people don't put their trust in presidents. We put our hope in and seek salvation in Jesus Christ, who is the only Savior. And you're like, of course, I told you, not new. Just recalibrating reminder. Recalibrating reminder number two, God is king, right? And he's, he's on the throne and he's sovereign. He's sovereign over the affairs of peoples and nations and presidents. This is in no means to diminish our fights and, or not fights, our opinions and, and our desires. But it is a recalibrating reminder. The third one is that it's a recalibrating reminder that we need to hear that I'm, I am a child of the Most High God. And as such, I'm a citizen of that kingdom. I have an eternal perspective. Remember that. Just remember this. Don't ever forget that you're first and foremost, a son or a daughter of the most high God, right? Let's, let's have our communication, our words in this contentious political season, and our behaviors reflect this reality. Our fourth reminder, to recalibrate our hearts. America is not the last great hope for Christianity. No, as a matter of fact, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the last and only hope for America. And therefore, fear and hopelessness have no real home. They should never take up residency in our hearts as believers in Jesus Christ. That real and everlasting freedom is not bought and paid for by presidents and governments. It's bought and paid for by Jesus Christ on the cross. And then this last recalibrating reminder Remember, joy and hope are ours. If we don't have joy, as believers in Jesus Christ, if we don't have hope, we are above all people to be pitied, as Paul would say. These joy, hope should not, for they cannot ever be shaken when our fo fake focus is on Jesus Christ. So, when we go into the voting booth, on Tuesday, and we wake up on Wednesday, will you place your hope in God and God alone, not in a politician or party? Now, some of you are going to wish that I had gone in this direction, and others are going to wish I had gone in that direction, and some would have wished I probably didn't say anything at all. <laughs> but can I share one last hope for us as a family. My hope for us is that the fight for lost souls of our neighbors would far outweigh any fight for a presidential candidate. 
I hope for us that our fight for unity amongst diversity because of our deep love for one another would far outweigh any fight for any constitutional right. That's my hope for us. That our love for lost souls would take our greatest energies and that our love for Jesus Christ and one another would get our greatest passion first. I'm not saying that none of these other things aren't important. But just as Jesus says, unless someone hate his mother, father, brother, sister, he will never enter the kingdom of God. Is he really saying, hate your mother, brother, father? And no. But he's saying, unless your love for me is greater than all of these things, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we bow before you as uh, desiring to make you our greatest love and, and desiring, will God, by your Holy Spirit, please, that you, our greatest passion would be in loving you and loving one another. And, and Father, that our hearts for lost souls would be so great. And with all of this in mind, we continue, we do, we lift up our elections, we lift up our country, we lift up all that's going on. We, we, don't, we don't pretend that it's not important. It is important, but God, we want it to be in this proper place. And so help us, God, to be people of hope, to be people of joy, to be people who are marked by that. That that's the posture of our heart towards even those who we have a fierce, difference of opinion with. And help us this Tuesday, this Wednesday, this week to be marked by hope, not fear, to be marked by joy, not anger. And we will trust you, God, as the one sovereign King of kings and Lord of lords in whom all the earth belongs. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.